Um, and then just keep that ministry in your prayers. And a big thanks to the Teasley family. There's going to be many donations in memory of Joe Teasley. So that's been a big help to the food pantry. And uh, also, some of the guys got together and did a service project for Mike Kelly yesterday and did a, a pressure washing at his house. And he said, just tell everybody hello. Um, so that was a, was a good uh, effort to do that. Thanks to William for coordinating that. So we're going to begin our worship now. So I will uh, turn it over to think, our, our music. Thanks. Let's go begin our worship.
not only us here uh, locally, but around the world. Father, we're thankful for all those that are, are around the world preaching your word. And Father, for the missions that are going on, Father, the missions that we support. Father, we ask that you will specifically bless them and bless all their doings. Father, we're thankful to be here this morning and ask that you will continue to be with us through our worship. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Started to, started to the tomb. Both were running, 
But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was the cloth was folded up by the bed, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. Then they still do not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. So the Scripture talks about the empty tomb. And so many times in communion we focus on the cross and the incredible sacrifice and death of Jesus and which is incredibly important, the cross and the suffering of Christ. But really the most important part and the amazing part is that he rose from the dead. He did not stay in the tomb. And so we also celebrate not only his death and his sacrifice and the brutality of the cross, but also his resurrection. So let's pray together this morning. Father, God, you are the amazing creator of all things. Yet you want a relationship with us. And you want a relationship with us for all time, Lord. So much so that you're willing to forgive us of all the, the wrongs and all the, the struggles and issues in our life and our sin. And you've done that through your gift of your son, Jesus. We thank you that you sent him to, to the earth to live like us. Uh, and his willingness to also die the brutal death on the cross, Lord. But also to be raised to live a, a new life with you forever and, and to show that he has power over death, that he raised from the dead, that he could change everything for all time. And God, help us as we take the, the bread this morning. For those here, it's so good to be back and, and doing this communion together. But also, Father, for all of us who are at home, please watch over them and help them as they continue to take communion together with us uh, remotely. Father, we thank you for Jesus and for his, his body that was broken and suffered for us on the cross. And it's through him we pray. Amen. continue our prayer. Lord, we thank you again in remembering Christ. We thank you for the blood that was shed, blood that led to the death, Father, that we can never imagine. Help us as we drink this juice, this fruit of the vine, to remember the blood that was shed for us. Not only for us, Father, but for everyone that we know, for the whole world. Help us to be mindful about those we speak to that our words might reflect the love that you have for us. Our actions might reflect the love that you have for us. Uh, thank you again for your son Jesus and it's through him we pray. Amen.
Hey. Good morning. Morning. Testing, testing. Can we have both mics on, Adam? Testing is hilarious. Um, testing, testing. While we bring this out, Ephesians five. That's where we're gonna be. Does that sound better? Ephesians five. Um, again, good morning. I've got to say I. I've gotten used to speaking to a camera, so having a few people in here, if I make any weird faces, that's that's why I made the mask, we'll cover it up. But one of the benefits of speaking into a camera was I could just turn it off and start over, and I did that many times. And so if I mess up, we'll just keep going. Um, for the majority of you who are watching at, at home, I want you to know that um, it's still very strange for us, and even though we're physically apart, we're moving forward. And it, may not really feel that way, you know, there's only a few of us in here, but we are trying our best to move forward, and, and I know there's a lot of impatience, a lot of frustration, a lot of just questions of the future, and uh, my, my hope and my prayer is that we can continue to move forward, both uh, in, in faith and confidence in God, but also in, in wisdom, and that's what we're trying uh, to do. Before we enter into our sermon this morning, I wanted to share uh, something from an article I read the other day. And this article is about the mental health uh, of our healthcare workers, especially in, in bigger cities, and how a lot of uh, first responders, a lot of healthcare workers are really suffering, really suffering through this pandemic, through the long hours, through the things that they are witnessing with their own with their own eyes, and the things that they're trying to, to do um, to take care of our country. And uh, there's many uh, counseling services and many groups who are really trying to uh, to reach out and to provide resources. And there was one uh, procedure that this one healthcare group um, required of, of their of their staff, their people called uh, Check You Check Two. It's called a Check You Check Two initiative. And uh, this initiative, the idea is when you come to work, you check yourself. Not just physically, but you check yourself mentally, emotionally, you know, where are you, how are you processing everything, to be aware of yourself. And then you check two other people. So you check yourself and then it turns into checking into two other people, calling them, two other colleagues throughout the day and see how they're doing. And I just love this, uh, this idea because it's a very biblical idea, you know, and I think that's a very good idea for us to keep in the back of our minds as we continue to move forward. You know, we need to continually check ourselves, uh, check ourselves and see how we're doing, uh, not only physically, emotionally, but also spiritually. You know, it's a, it's a, if you're like me, the first couple weeks, it was, it was just kind of interesting, it was new, it was sort of, you know, we're, we're, there's a lot of, you know, uh, potential for good things in the midst of a very bad thing, um, and we were creative with ideas, and then the burn hit, and two weeks later, uh, I'm, I'm really starting to burn out on this whole thing. I know many of you are as well. And it's important to, you know, analyze ourselves and see where we're at and, and to be honest with not just physically, but also, you know, our mental space, but also um, spiritually. You know, it's it's not the same worshiping online. We're trying our best to recreate it, but it's not the same as, as being around other people. And, and I know that. And so we want to be honest with where we're at spiritually. Reach out if we're in need. I'm going to keep adjusting this mask uh, throughout the whole sermon. But, you know, check check where we're at um, spiritually, but also then make sure we're intentionally tapping the shoulders of two other people, at least two other people. You know, being aware of our brothers and sisters uh, of all ages, uh, no matter where they're at, you know, just seeing how we are doing. I think that's a very uh, biblical idea. So let us continue to uh, encourage and pray for one another. So as we go into Ephesians 5, as you know, we've been doing um, a series talking about focusing on the family within our larger theme for the year. The theme being, you know, focusing uh, on Jesus. You know, what does that look like in our families? And specifically this week and last week, the question has been, what does that look like within our own uh, marriages? We look at the creation of marriages uh, and marriage in Genesis 2. That, you know, that we are created to exist in a, in a community. We are created to exist uh, in, a, in a family. And that, you know, it was not good for man to be alone. He was supposed to live in uh, community. And so this morning we're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5, specifically verses 22 through 32, and we're going to study the topic uh, of Christian marriage. You know, what does it look like specifically with Jesus at the center of our marriage? You know, when we really elevate Christ with our marriages, what does that do? How does that 
changes? What effect might that have? How do I focus on Jesus within my marriage? So that's the question I want us to think about. And before we read our passage, I want us to look back and look at, I'll, I'll just back all the way up to verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 5, where it says, Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. And then here's this phrase, but be filled with the Spirit. Now that is a very important phrase because it sets the stage for everything that we read following. Be filled with the Spirit. This is a class that Adam has been going through on Wednesday night, talking about the Holy Spirit. He spent a lot of time talking about this idea of being filled with the Spirit. So the question is, how do you do that? What does that look like? Well, there's four phrases as you continue to read that sort of unpack what it means to be filled with the Spirit. It says, addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. That's one. Singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. That's two. Giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's three. And this fourth one I really want us to pay attention to because this is really going to be prevalent to our study when we talk about Christian marriage in the following verses. Verse 21 says, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submitting to one another is the effects of, of a spirit-filled body. When the spirit fills the church, when the spirit is changing you and transforming you to the image of Christ, it automatically requires you to lower yourself. It requires you to be humble like Jesus. It requires you to submit to one another, to the needs of one another. And we need that more than, more than ever uh, today. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of questions about how we're going to move forward through all this. And, and the best thing we can do is, like Paul says in Philippians 2, to consider the needs of other people as more important than ourselves. So love your neighbor as yourself. What does that look like? It looks like submitting to uh, one another. And that sets the stage as we go into our text, Ephesians chapter 5. And this is the context of this first verse we're going to read in verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body. It is himself its Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, Hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So there's there's three things to unpack here. The first is in verses 22 through 24, when Paul tells wives to submit to your own husbands. Now, what exactly does that mean? Well, the first thing I want us to think about is the fact that it's, look, the reason I read the context is that this, this outworking of the relationship between the wife and the husband sits within the context of the church as a whole submitting to one another. So the way a wife treats her husband and the way her husband, the way, the way a husband treats his wife is a symbol of of the relationships that exist within uh, the church. It is, it is a microcosm of what it looks like to submit to one another. And so going into that, it says wives are to submit to their own husbands. Now, this is a passage that has been used and misused countless times for countless years. Um, and I don't pretend to have it all uh, figured out, but I think the best way to define what submission is 
is to define what submission is not. Submission is not staying in uh, an abusive relationship. Those are not synonymous. Abuse is not submission. Submission does not mean that one is weaker spiritually, right? It does not mean that one is speaker, uh, weaker spiritually. Um, submission does not mean that one is spiritually passive. You know, wives are to take a very active and engaging role in the spiritual well-being of not only their family, but their marriage. You know, the, some of the times I've been the challenge the most spiritually has been either through um, Amber telling me to clean, them, clean up my mess, you know, that uh, I need to cut something out, or just through her example, you know. Uh, I, I spent a lot of years um, in school and buried in books, and it's been very challenging for me to, to go from what the book says to practicing it and living it out in my own life. But Amber, she does that naturally. You know, I remember uh, one time we were, we were doing a road trip to Alaska. I didn't plan to share the story. We are doing a road trip to Alaska, and I remember I'm on a one-track mind. I have a goal set for that day, and we're going to get to that destination by this time, and that's in my mind. And we're at a gas station, and I said, okay, in and out. Right? We're going in and out. We're going to get these things. We're going to get gas, and we're going... And I go and get the my response, I get the drinks or whatever, and I come to the gas station. And somehow, within that 30 seconds, she is having this conversation with this cashier about her kids and grandkids and you know all those struggles she had with parenting. And, all. and I'm like, what in the world? But it was such a beautiful moment because she just has the ability to really um, tap into people's lives. That's a gift that she has. And through that gift, it's really impacted me spiritually, you know, to she really demonstrates to me what it looks like to live out a Christ-like life, you know, to go from books to action, um, as I was saying. And so, you know, to, to be submissive does not mean to take a back seat spiritually. It does not mean that there's no influence. It does not, definitely does not mean um, that one stays in an abusive relationship. And so with those type of things in mind, it allows one to approach what this verse says, you know, what submission is. Once you know what submission is not, it becomes a lot easier for uh, wives to submit to their husbands. Now, the wife's submission in this passage is based on two things. One in verse 22 and then one in verse uh, 24. So it says, wives are to submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So this relationship that, that the wife has with the husband exists within the context of her own personal relationship with uh, uh, the Lord. It's her own spiritual responsibility, which is a huge deal. Because when we read this passage, we realize that Paul's speaking to the wife, not to the husband to put his wife in submission. Now, this is between God and her. Wives are to submit to, own, to, to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. But in verse 24, it also says, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit, to, should submit in everything uh, to their their husbands. So you have as to the Lord in verse 22, and then you have as the church submits to Christ. And, and one of the things that we see as we read this passage is that this relationship between the woman and the man, the wife and the husband, serves an example between the relationship between, the, between Christ and, and the church. Um, but it's important to know that this command is between God and uh, the woman. I've, I've heard you know, men come up to me and they're really frustrated about something and they'll say, she just, she just needs to submit to me. I'm thinking, brother, you better, you better do some prayer, you know, because this isn't the truth. This is, he wasn't speaking to you. You know, this is, this is to, this is to the wife. This is her own voluntary act that she is, I mean, she didn't have to marry you. You know, this is a voluntary act that she um, chooses to participate in um, and chooses to engage in, in the context of her own personal relationship uh, with uh, the Lord. So the, the address of the husband comes in the next verse, in verse uh, 25 and following. Husbands are to love your wife. And at first blush, we might say, well, that's a little easier. Well, it's not. It's not easier at all. Why? Because the, what's the comparison? It says, just like Christ loved the church. And so when we look at the picture of Jesus loving the church, what does he do? Hangs on the tree for it. Right? He, he absolutely submits or sacrifices everything about himself for the sake of the life and prosperity and the sanctification of his wife, of his bride, of the church. I mean, his faith
face is set towards Jerusalem. He's heading to the cross so that no matter, come what may, no matter what happens to him, his wife is sanctified. His bride is sanctified. That's what it means to love your wife. It's not buying flowers occasionally, which is good. It's submitting all of my own personal wants, my own personal desires for the life and prosperity of the one that God has given me into this marriage. And so when we see this, when we see what it looks like to love your wife as Christ loved the church, what we're talking about is mutual submission. And that's a huge statement. It's easy to look at this from the outside and just really quick and say, wives are submitted to their husbands, husbands love their wives, and it becomes about authority. It's not about authority. It's about mutual love. It's about mutual submission. So when the husband loves his wife like Christ loves the church, that means he's willing to die to himself daily. I remember uh, hearing a, a sermon once where this preacher was really fired up, and he was saying, you know, husbands, raise your hand if you're, if you're willing to take a bullet for your wife. And everyone, of course, macho man, raise your hand, right? Well, if you're willing to, you know, stop running run up a train for your wife, of course, yes, absolutely. If you're willing to wash the dishes for your wife, we're like, oh, wait a second, you know, because, you know, a lot of us men, we're willing to do the big heroic things, but loving your wife like Christ of the church is not just dying once, it's dying daily. It's what, it's discipleship in action, daily picking up your cross, daily lowering yourself. And when that happens, and when the husband is elevating his wife above all things, like he appeals to in Genesis 2, when the husband, you know, leaves his father and mother and holds fast to his wife, we talked about that last week, about how that's about priority. You know, the husband doesn't move away from home necessarily, but the wife becomes more important than the parents and the children. And, and when, when he does that, all of a sudden, the other side of the equation is a lot easier. For wives to submit to their husbands as the spiritual head, as the church submits to Christ. That becomes a lot easier when the man understands his role. Understands what it is, understands uh, what it isn't. Right? So the purpose, he says in this passage, Christ died so, quote, that he might sanctify her. That's huge, right? Through his death, he preserves his bride. He saves her life. He sets her apart. Everything is about her about her life. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become uh, one flesh. I remember uh, in high school, uh, turning on the TV, I don't know what day it was, it was, I was doing nothing, and there was a televangelist on. And I remember being taught that all televangelists are evil, and then I became one in the past 10 weeks. Um, but, you know, I was told that, hey, you know, don't listen to anything on TV. So I'm going in with full skepticism glasses on. And he starts saying, he starts talking about this verse in the Bible that says that if husbands don't fulfill their duty and fulfill their role as they should, that God's not going to listen to his prayers. And I thought, this guy's bogus. But then he quotes the verse. I said, okay, I guess I'll read it. And it's 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, husbands... Live with your wives in an understanding way. Under, notice how he said it. He didn't say, understand your wives. He said, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. That's a huge thing. And then it says, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. And then it says, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, which is huge. They are heirs with you. They're not inferior. You are co-heirs to eternal life so that your prayers may not be hindered. And that was a scary verse. I mean, that was an absolutely terrifying verse. I wasn't even married. I was in high school. But I was thinking, man. And his point was, husbands, if you don't fulfill this role, you know, if, you, if you take advantage of your role, if you take advantage of your, your role as spiritual head of this marriage, of this family, and, and, you, and, you, and you lower her, and you use the, quote, weaker vessel. What does he say? He says, your prayers, there's a wall that comes up between you and God. That, that you can't get away with this relationship with God if you're not treating the relationships you have more close to you with a god or in way. It, it's, a, it's a smaller version of what John says in 1 John. 
when he says the relationship between you and God um, is dependent on the relationship you have between your brothers and sisters. That how can I say I love someone I don't see? Uh, how can I say that I love someone I don't see and I fail to love the people that I can see? And if I can't love the person sitting right next to me, I can't love my own spouse. God says, you better clean that up if you want to have a relationship with me. Because a relationship with God is supposed to change you, right? It's supposed to transform you. Not just in an abstract way, but in the most intimate parts of your life. A relationship with God is supposed to make you a better husband. It's supposed to make you a better wife. And then, of course, you keep going. A better parent, a better child, a better... It's supposed to transform your most intimate relationships. And that's where Peter really gets personal. So that your prayers may not be hindered. It's an intimidating verse. But it's, it's very informative because as we come back to Ephesians 5, we learn that if we don't take this seriously as husbands, if husbands don't take their role seriously, don't love their wife like Christ loved the church, it may very well interrupt my relationship with, with God. You know, God, God may say, I'll put, I'll put your prayers in a, in a folder over here and so say, you, you, you start cleaning up your mess, you know. But once husbands begin to shape their role in light of what Christ did for the church, it, the rest of it really starts to iron out. It becomes a lot easier for the wife to fulfill her role. And if a husband's not doing his role, it becomes a lot harder for her to fulfill uh, her role. But then as we move into point three, he, he's, he gives us a little hint here in verse uh, uh, 32 and 33 that this is about something bigger than just marriage. And that living with Christ at the center of our marriage is bigger than just having a good marriage. What does he say? He says this mystery is profound. I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let your wife see that she respects her husband. So he, he concludes well, and he says that this message is practical to the husband and the wife. You know, husbands, love your, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. And that when you have Christ that's in your marriage, it will really uh, make your marriage a beautiful thing. You know, that's something that we talked about last week, that when God creates marriage, it, it's, it's created as a beautiful thing. Thing. And we live in a culture that does not celebrate marriage. We live in a culture that does not uh, honor marriage for a variety of, of reasons. But at the very beginning, it wasn't created to be a, a place where when you get married, you have to leave yourself identity behind and you can't pursue your hopes and dreams. And marriage is something that's supposed to empower you to live to the fullest in your Christian walk. And the way you do that, according to Ephesians 5, is by looking to Christ and the church as an example. But then he says, in, this verse, in the verse before, in verse 32, he says, this is a profound mystery, that this relationship between the husband and the wife is a symbol, not just for you, but for everyone you come into contact with. It's a symbol of the relationship between Christ and the church. That if you're doing this right, if you're doing this right, husbands, if you're laying your wife down every single day for the sake of your bride, and you're swallowing your own pride, and you're really putting your own ego in the back of your mind, if you're doing that, and wise, if you are respecting your husbands and submitting to the spiritual headship and spiritual role that God has placed him in, if you're fulfilling these two roles, when people look at that, when your kids look at that marriage, when you know, when your siblings, when your neighbors, when your workers, when, when the families that you come into contact, when they see that type of marriage, they're going to see something bigger than just two happy people. They're going to see Christ himself. Because only Christ can make a marriage like that. Right? Now, it takes two to tango. It takes two to tango. And there's a whole series we can do on, you know, what happens when one partner isn't fulfilling the role. And in many ways, that's, that's, that's beyond my own expertise. But but when we're looking at the ideal Christian marriage, when we're looking at what it looks like that Christ is in our marriage, what Paul says in verse 32 is, this is bigger than you. This is way bigger than you. This is bigger, bigger than just having a happy marriage. And when people see this, they see a profound mystery. They see Christ in the church. Because as we read in 
verse 21 that the relationship between a husband and a wife is an example, is evidence, and is outworking of verse 21. Submitting to one another. Which is a function of what? Being filled with the Spirit. So it points to something bigger than ourselves. So when Christ is the center of our marriage, in conclusion, you no longer have to worry about who has authority, who has power, who's in control. Your marriage becomes about mutuality. It becomes about mutual sacrifice. It becomes about mutual submission. Right? It's mutual submission. It's not her submitting to me because I've got a big chest and I'm, you know, I don't know. It's her submitting to me as I submit my life for her. And in that mutuality, Christ is glorified and Christ is um, evident to everyone around us. This is what it looks like to have Christ at the center of our marriage. It's not just about making our marriage work. I think that's where a lot of marriage books fall short. The end goal is just to not make our, just make our, to have a happy marriage. This is a good goal, but it's not the end goal. The end goal is to have a good, healthy, Christ-centered marriage so that our marriage can be a symbol to everybody we have influence with of what's bigger than us, and that is that Christ died for us, the church. For those of us who are married, let us focus on Christ in our marriages. Let us submit to one another as to the Lord. Let us lay down our desires, our lives, for the sake of one another. And may our marriages and, and our families in general, may, not, may they not only be strong for their own sake, but may they have spiritual influence on our families, on everyone uh, around us. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this morning to begin to meet together uh, once again. Although in small numbers this morning, we know that the church is full. Although many of our pews are empty, we know that the church is, is absolutely full this morning as we worship together, most of us uh, online. We know that we are still your church. We know that we are not reopening the church, but we are reassembling, for the church never closed. And may we consistently remember who we are and whose we are. May we consistently remember that we are a church that Christ died for. And that through his example and through his laying down of his own life, he empowers us to live in any function of our family, whether it be our marriages, as we talked about this morning, or any other family relationships. He sets an example for us uh, to, to, to have Christ at the center of our most intimate relationships for the sake of your glory and for the sake of spiritual influence on our family and our neighborhood and our friends and our work and our people in our workplace. Father, as we move forward over the next few weeks, um, we pray that you give us both faith and wisdom. We pray that you that you uh, constantly remind us that you are in control, that you are sovereign, that you are good, and that you will faithfully get us through this. Um, but we pray that you also uh, give us wisdom to know how about the, 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 the best and most prudent ways to move forward. And we just pray that um, you might be glorified in all things, that we can still fulfill um, our duties as your church who Christ died for in the midst of a, of a chaotic pandemic. Father, we love you and pray all these things in the name of your Son and the power of your Spirit and to your glory. Amen.
and fears and uncertainties, Father. But Father, we uh, thanks to you and, and your Son Jesus that we realize that uh, if we live live our lives right in accordance to Thy will, that uh, that the worst thing that can happen to us, Father, is that we spend eternity with you, and that's a, that's a great encouragement, a great great hope, Father. Father, I pray that uh, you'll be with our sick and our shut-ins, uh, be with their families and their doctors. Uh, pray that you restore them to their normal places in life. Father, as we uh, dismiss this morning, we just pray that you'll watch over us, guide, guard, and direct us. And all this we pray in your name. Amen. Amen.